Okay, so in this class tonight, we're going to talk about section 1256 contracts. Section 1256 contracts are treated like no other asset, um, like no other asset under the Internal Revenue Code. And in order to understand why we ended up treating Section 1256 contracts the way they are being treated, we really have to understand the history on what taxpayers were using these contracts for, how, why Congress reacted to that, why they created Section 1256. Um, we also have to understand the economics of a futures contract, which is the main Section 1256 contract, or was the main Section 1256 contract when the law was initially passed. And once we understand the economics of how futures contract works, we'll better understand the support as to why we end up um, treating 1256 contracts the way we do. Um, we'll also get into a little bit about American politics, and that will explain the nature of the gains and losses um, that apply to Section 1256 contracts. So there's a lot to explain as to why we ended up where we ended up. And then there's one last thing. When Section 1256 was first enacted, it dealt primarily with futures contracts. And as I said, I'll go into the economics of futures contracts and why um, the way Section 1256 works makes, some, makes sense with respect to futures contracts. But since that time, we've added a major um, other type of contract that's subject to Section 1256, and those are certain types of option contracts. And we've just gone over the taxation of um, stock options under Section 1234, under you know, equity options, and those options are treated in a more um, common way than with, uh, with respect to taxes as other assets, right? Um, holding period determines our gain and loss when we buy a call or buy a put on a stock. Um, that's not true when we're dealing with Section 1256 contracts um, that are also options. Um, and because of that, we end up with some very interesting tax results. We end up with some um, transactions that have similar economics. Of, and we end up with very, very different tax results, which allows it, which be, could become a trap or it could become a planning opportunity, but you have to be aware of it. So let me um, share the screen. Let me get the PowerPoint. And we'll start. So we're dealing again with it's Internal Revenue Code Section 1256. And what happens under Code Section 1256 um, is, as I said, it's treating these assets like no other assets. And this is the treatment given to everyone who trades in Section 1256 contracts. So it doesn't matter if you're a trader um, or an investor. Um, dealers are given special treatment. But outside of dealers, if we're dealing with traders or investors, this is the tax treatment. And again, in our course, I want to focus on investors. So the first thing is, all your 1256 contracts are treated as sold on the last day of the year. Now, the, co the code uses the word sold. It really should be um, treated as closed. But it's a closing event. And when you treated it, when you treat these transactions as closed, then in effect, you're recognizing all the unrealized gain in that contract on the last day of the year. So you're paying tax on gains um, that you haven't realized yet. That's different than any other asset. If I buy stocks and I buy, I buy Apple for $100,000 in the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, it's at $150,000, but I haven't sold it, I don't recognize any gain. And with Apple, that makes sense because if I recognize the gain, and I have to pay tax, where am I gonna get the money? I haven't sold the stock. Um, the government's not gonna accept my, uh, some Apple shares as payment for the taxes. And with stock, I don't have access 
to the cat to the value. I can't just pull it out of my account. And if I wanted to take it out of the account, I'd have to borrow the money and have to pay it back to the broker. And I still can't even borrow the full amount under our margin rules. Um, so treating stocks sold on the last day of the year would be, would be a terrible result. Uh, we're going to see why dealing with Section 1256 contracts really isn't as unfair um, as it sounds. By the way, if you have losses on 1256 contracts, at the end of the year and they're unrealized, you're able to deduct those, you recognize that. So it doesn't matter whether it's a gain or a loss, um, you recognize it as though you closed out the transaction on the last day of the year. And then instead of giving you a basis adjustment, and this was one of the first code sections that started doing this and now it's become more prevalent. But whenever we have to recognize a gain um, before a real disposition. And we'll be talking about other code sections later on um, when this occurs. Instead of getting a basis adjustment, they tell you to adjust um, the subsequent gains or losses in subsequent years for the previous mark to market gain or loss. And we'll go through examples with dealing with all of these things. And this is where it becomes very interesting. All gains and losses shall be treated as 60% long-term and 40% short-term. Doesn't matter how long you held your position open. It doesn't matter whether you bought the position or whether you sold the position um, when you started it. Everything is 60% long-term and 40% short-term. So again, con contrasting that with equity options that are taxed under se section 1234, the, if you buy the call or you buy a put, the holding period of the call or put determines whether the gain or loss is 100% long-term or 100% short-term. Also, if you open an option position by selling the option, right? When you write an option, we said, we don't care how long that option position is held open for. Any gain or loss is treated as short-term. So that's not true with these things. And we'll see where that starts to create confusion. Also, when we exercise an option under section 1234, when we exercise a stock option, that was treated as a purchase of stock and a non-taxable event. And our basis in the option get, got added to the strike price that we had to pay to buy the stock um, if we were exercising a call option, and that became our new basis in the underlying stock. Our holding period started anew, but we did not recognize any gain or loss on an exercise. Now, if we bought a put option and exercised our put option, well, now we're selling stock. Um, so we still don't have a gain or loss with respect to the option. It's no longer an option transaction, it became a stock transaction. And then we looked to the holding period of the stock to see whether or not we had a long-term gain or loss. All right, we, we, the rules with this are gonna be very different and we'll get into those rules. Um, we're gonna talk about straddles next week. Um, and all, we're, all I'm gonna say here is that um, straddle rules will not apply if all positions making up a straddle are, are section 1256 contracts. And then next week when we talk about the straddle rules, We'll come back to this rule and show you why this makes sense. Um, but when, as I said, when we do this next week, it'll be very obvious why the straddle rules um, wouldn't apply if all of the positions making up the straddle are 1256 contracts. Okay, so now that I keep talking about these 1256 contracts, the question is, what are they? And by the way, the section 1256 is a code section that is very difficult to read. And the reason I think it's very difficult to read is if you try to read it like a book, so you wanna read 1256A, 1256B, 1256C, um, you, learn, you get the rules in 1256A. So just like I did in the previous slide, I'm they tell you that the treat is sold on the last day of the year, adjustments shall be made in the subsequent year for previous mark-to-market gains and losses, everything is 60-40. 
and straddle rules will not apply. That's all in Code Section 1256A. You have no idea what they're talking about. And it's not until the very end of Section 1256 that they start defining what is a 1256 contract. So it's a very, to me, it's a very illogically written code section. I like to know what I'm dealing with before I know the rules. So with Code Section 1256, I would read the, the back of the section first to see what, what are they talking about and then come back uh, to the beginning. But again, that could be your own style. You might just like to read the code like a book, read it in order, and then try to put everything together afterwards. Okay, so what are they? When, code, when 1256 was first enacted, it really dealt with futures contracts. And they're called, for tax purposes, they're called regulated futures contracts. So what's a regulated futures contract? It's a, so I'm gonna read you the definition and then I'll tell you what, what these things really are. Um, they're a contract with respect to which amounts required to be deposited or may be withdrawn, depends on a system of marketing to market and which is traded on a qualified board or, or exchange, qualified board of exchange. Um, so it could be a securities exchange registered with the SEC or a domestic board of trade designated as a contract market by the CFTC. And it's really, the, or, and if the secretary says it's okay, then we could go outside of the US. But remember, when we're dealing with the SEC and we're dealing with the CFTC, we're only dealing with markets in the United States. Um, and the only one that I know of that the um, treasury said was okay was Sinex. I'm not sure of any others. There might be one exchange in London that the treasury also said is okay, but I'm not sure. So what does all this mean in English? So let me go to the whiteboard. And what they're really talking about are futures contracts that you can find in the Wall Street Journal. And they'll be under um, futures, or commodities and they're all traded under on exchanges regulated by the commodities um, the CFTC so what are some futures there are futures on oil there are futures on corn um, oats so I'll give you the agricultural ones, wheat and soybeans. And the acronym that people use to remember the agricultural are cows, corn, oats, wheat, soybeans, oil. Um, there are bond futures, there are treasury bond futures. And then I'll, def I'll define what a future is, treasury bond futures. And these are all futures contracts. So treasury bonds, treasury bills. Um, currencies. All right, the major currencies would be the um, euro, the pound, Swiss franc, Canadian dollar. Australian dollar, and the New Zealand dollar. And of course the yen. So those are the major currencies, they all have futures. And, and now what's developed is that there really are futures on virtually every currency in the world. Um, but a lot of those futures trade by appointment. They don't really, are, they aren't actively traded. Um, and so what is a futures contract? And a futures contract and some other futures that I left out. Um, so I just wanna go back to them quickly. Are precious metals. So it'll be, Futures contracts in gold, silver, platinum, 
um, palladium, and so on and so forth. So there are futures contracts on just uh, countless different types of commodities. So what is a futures contract? Um, a futures contract is a contract to buy. And then obviously if someone's buying, the other side is selling. The buyer sell a certain quantity of a commodity. So if we have um, a futures contract on gold, It's always 100 ounces, 24 karat gold, and 24 karat. And it has to be delivered in certain numerated warehouses. So when you enter into a contract to buy gold, so let's assume I enter into one contract to buy gold, and it will have a maturity date. And the maturity date will be a month. And so let's assume it's September to buy gold in September at 1300 an ounce. So what does that mean? That means that the buyer agrees to buy 100 ounces of gold for delivery on the third Friday. It's either the third Friday or the third Thursday. The third Friday of, of September for $1,300 an ounce. And the other side of this contract is the seller agrees to sell 100 ounces of gold for delivery on the third Friday of September for 1,300. Um, this is not an option, option. Buyer must buy and seller must sell. So if you think about it, let's assume that gold is trading for about $1,300 an ounce today. We enter into a contract to buy 100 ounces of gold for delivery on the third Friday of September for $1,300. Um, if gold goes, if I'm the buyer and gold goes up to $1,500 an ounce, right? So let's assume um, I bought, I enter into contract. to buy at 1300 an ounce. And now gold goes up to 1500 an ounce. Well, my profit is $200 times 100, because my contract is covering 100 ounces. So my profit is $20,000. The way these contracts work is they're mark to market on a daily basis. What that means is the buyer who's made money can withdraw $20,000 from their account. And where's that money coming from? It's coming from the seller. Seller must deposit $20,000. 
$20,000. Um, and it's very important that the broker make sure that they maintain all the proper margin requirements because if the seller is not depositing the 20,000 and the buyer is withdrawing the 20,000, the dealer could end up with a lot of problems. But what's different about commodities and futures contracts and what's very different about them um, as opposed to stocks is when I'm making money and the price is going up, I can take money out of my account. I don't have to sell it. And why is that? Because I've already showed the dealer for however they've asked me to show for it, that I could buy their gold for $130 an ounce. I have enough to pay for 1300 an ounce. I have enough to pay for the um, gold at 1300 an ounce. Um, and so as it moves up, I can pull the profit out. Now, what's interesting is when you enter into one of these contracts, you don't put up the entire $130,000. All you do is you put up a margin requirement. And in the case of gold, that margin requirement might be about $10,000. So you put up $10,000 and it's just a deposit. What it's showing is you're putting, making a good faith deposit saying that if you're really gonna end up buying the gold, you, that 10,000 can be used to pay for the $130,000. Now remember, if you don't come up with the rest of it, they can always sell the gold um, on your behalf. They're gonna force you to sell the gold and that's the way you'll generate the 130,000 or whatever the price of gold is at that time. Um, that's why um, the seller keeps putting in more and more money when the price is moving against them. Because if they're gonna to to sell it for 130,000, um, in order for them to buy it, they're gonna to have to pay 150,000. And so the dealer wants to know that they have that $20,000 loss available. Um, so that's why they put that into the account. But if, my, if I keep, if I'm able to pull out my, gain, then I don't have the problem that I had with um, stocks. If I want to tax that gain, the person who is making money on that futures contract actually has the cash to pay the tax. So that's part of the justification for taxing the unrealized gain at the end of the year. You're not putting an undue burden on the investor. They have access to that cash. They have access to the entire gain so it's not terrible to make them pay tax on their unrealized gain. And if the price of gold goes down, then the buyer is depositing money. The seller of the gold is withdrawing the money. And so it doesn't matter if you, if you enter into a contract to buy gold, which is called being long gold, or if you enter into a contract to sell gold, which would be called short gold. Either way, when the contract moves in your favor, you have access to that cash, you have access to your profits. So Congress said, there's nothing wrong with forcing investors on futures contracts to pay tax on their unrealized gains and losses. But what led Congress to, to even think about this? And we'll go into this into a lot more detail next week when we talk about straddles. But what, what people were doing um, and I want you to focus on the bottom. So <clears throat> think of what's going on. I can only, I only have to put up $10,000 to enter into a contract to buy 100 ounces of gold, which is controlling $130,000 worth of gold. And what people were doing is they would enter into a contract to buy gold at 1300 an ounce for delivery in January. And then they would sell gold at 1300 $10 an ounce for delivery in February. And the difference that gold trades is a difference from month to month because whatever the interest rate is, you multiply that by the price of gold divided by 12 and 
that's the difference in the price between January gold and February gold. It's just the cost to carry the gold, which is basically interest. Um, but what ends up happening is if, if January gold goes up to $1,400 an ounce, right? So if January gold goes to $1,400 an ounce, February gold will go to $1,410 an ounce. And so if I've entered into one contract to buy gold at 1300 and I've entered into one contract to sell gold at 1310 on my buy, I've made $100 per ounce for 100 ounces, I'm up $10,000. And on my sell, I'm down $10,000. And what investors were doing is they would recognize the loss, recognize loss on sell contract. And they would do that on December 31st. And then on January 1st, they would recognize their gain. And they actually did something else to protect themselves overnight. They really didn't take overnight risk, but I just want to show you this. Um, and remember, for tax purposes, we do everything on a taxable year. So in the first year, they have a loss. It goes against their other income. and eliminates their tax. And then the following year, they recognize the income and then at the end of the year, they do it all over again. And if you just keep doing this year after year after year, you're never paying taxes. You just keep deferring everything to the next year, to the next year, to the next year. Then you finally die, you get a step up in basis. No one ever pays tax. And this was going on. And they were all doing this with futures contracts. And that's when Congress said, this, may, this is crazy. All these people in Chicago, where all these futures contracts trade, they're not paying any taxes. They're making, they're actually making money, doing their trading, doing their business during the year. And then at the end of the year, they do these um, futures trades and they don't pay taxes. And so they, they did two things. They enacted the straddle rules, which we're gonna talk about next week, but they also enacted section 1256. And 1256 said mark to market, your futures contracts. Well, if we mark to market our futures contracts and we have a gain of 10,000 or loss of 10,000, guess what? We haven't done anything. So section 1256 was meant to stop this year end recognition of losses. So we've said, we're gonna mark to market futures contracts. When they passed the law in 1981, um, the, the traders in Chicago said, "What you know, we're not going to be able to pay the taxes. Um, and it's not fair because if we're marking these things to market and holding period is one year in order to get long-term capital gains, by definition, we can never get a long-term capital gain on any of our trading, on any of our investments. And the person who was in charge of the Ways and Means Committee in our House of Representatives, and they're the committee that uh, make up the tax rules. Guess what? He was from Chicago. Um, and his name was Dan Rostenkowski, um, who ended up having legal problems of his own afterwards. If you want to do a Google search on Dan Rostenkowski, you can find a lot of interesting information. And what he was able to get through was the 60-40 treatment. And his argument was, 
um, by marking to market, you can never have long-term gains. So an equitable, so an equitable result was the 60-40 split. And that makes sense. Also, remember when the rule was first came into being, the thing that they were really looking at were futures contracts. And if I own a futures contract, to buy gold or um, own a futures contract to sell gold, I really own an asset. I'm just on the opposite side of the asset. The person who owns a futures contract to buy gold is part of a contract. If I'm on the other side and I own a futures contract to sell gold, we shouldn't be getting disparate tra tax treatment. And even though we call it long and short, we're really not short anything. We're not borrowing anything, but you know, and with equity options, we're not borrowing anything either. But they were able to make a very cohesive, a very good argument that owning a futures contract to buy or owning a futures contract to sell are the same thing. You own the same asset that should be given the same tax treatment. So we've, we're giving the 60-40 treatment regardless of whether the position is long or short. All right, so right now, those are the rules and they apply to futures contracts. And again, futures contracts are contracts that are traded in the United States. They're on all these different commodities. They're on currencies, they're on bonds, they're on precious metals, they're on regular metals, um, iron ore, nickel, um, things that are used um, for production. And what also came about after this law came into being was we came up with futures contracts on stock indices. So one of the most heavily traded futures contract is the futures contract on the S&P 500. So there's a futures contract on S&P 500. And so they said, gee, if futures contracts on the S&P 500 are given 60-40 treatment and this mark-to-market treatment, and there are options trading on the S&P 500, shouldn't they be given the same treatment? Why are we giving futures contract one treatment and options on other treatment um, when they're on the same thing? And so code section 1256 was expanded. And it now covers options on the S&P 500. But there are also options on gold. And again, the argument was, if futures contracts on gold are treated under section 1256, shouldn't options on gold be treated under 1256? And Congress said, yes, you're right. So instead of just coming up with a rule that options on stock indices are going to be treated under 1256 or options on gold are gonna be treated as 1256, what they said is non-equity options are section 1256 contracts. And what's a non-equity option? It's an 
an option on anything except an equity, which is a terrible definition. So they then went on to say, and an equity is a, is, um, a share of stock of a corporation. So what that means is section 1256 applies to all options except for options where the underlying property is a share of stock. If the underlying property is anything but a share of stock and it's traded on an exchange, so they always have to be traded on an exchange, then those options are also section 1256 contracts. And this is where things start to get a little confusing. And so, so bear with me. Um, I want to buy an interest in the S&P 500. And there are a few ways I can do that. First, I could just buy every stock in the S&P 500. And I can leverage it. I can buy it on borrowed money. And as we've seen, I'll end up with here, I'll end up with interest expense, dividend income, and long-term gain or loss, depending on holding period. Instead of buying every stock, I could buy an ETF. Um, on the S&P 500. And virtually all ETFs on the S&P 500 are corporations. And they're treated as regulated investment companies under the code. We're not gonna get into regulated investment companies. Um, but if I own a regulated investment company, um, if I leverage it again, I'm gonna have interest expense. Um, they're gonna pass through the dividends. I'll have dividend income. And again, I'll have long-term gains or loss, depending on holding period. Now, the next thing I could do is I could buy an option on the mutual fund. If I buy an option on the mutual fund, that's an option on a ship, even though the mutual fund, all right, and the mutual fund invests in the S&P 500. So it's the same economics. They're buying the S&P 500 and instead of uh, me buying the S&P 500 directly, I'm buying it by owning the mutual fund. And instead of buying the mutual fund directly, I'm getting my economic exposure to the mutual fund through calls and puts, right? I will buy a call, sell a put. That will give me the same exposure as owning the underlying stock. And if you remember, we did that. But now I, buy, I own a call and I sell the put. Well, now there's no interest expense. It's, it's the interest expense is part of the cost of putting on the put, put in the call. It's embedded in the put in the call. So there is no interest expense for tax purposes. There is no dividend income. The, div, the expected dividend is part of the price that I'm paying for the put in the call. Um, and I'm going to have gain and loss on the call measured by holding period 
to see if it's long-term or short-term, but all gains and losses on put will be short-term, right? Because it's an option on a stock. Even though the underlying um, asset inside the mutual fund is the S&P 500, that's irrelevant. I bought a call and a, wrote a put on stock. And now what happens if instead of doing that, I buy a call, and sell a put on the S&P 500 index, and these things do exist. That is the same exact economics of mining call and selling put on the S&P 500 mutual fund. And remember buying the put and selling the call on the S&P 500 mutual fund was the same exact economics as buying the ETF on the S&P 500 Mutual fund was the same exact economics of buying every single stock in the S&P 500. But what are the tax results now? Once again, we have no interest expense. We have no dividends. But now all gains and losses on both the calls and the puts are treated as 60% long-term and 40% short-term. In addition, these options are marked to the market at year end. And gain or loss is recognized. Right. So you can do four different things. All of them have the same exact economics and we end up with different tax results um, depending on which one we use. So as I said, this could be a trap because you might be buying um, the puts and the calls on the S&P 500 index and you're planning on holding it for more than a year because these things go out for more than a year. Um, and all of a sudden, where you think you were gonna end up with long-term gains because you were expecting the S&P 500 to go way up. Um, and most of your gains were gonna be on the call option. And those gains would have all been treated as 100% long-term. And you thought they were, you weren't gonna recognize them until you sold the call at a gain. Well, guess what? All your gains on both your options on both the call and the put are gonna be recognized at year end. And they're not going to be 100% long-term. They're going to be 60% long-term and 40% short-term. Now, on the other hand, you might say, well, this is okay, because I really want, only wanted to invest in the S&P 500 for the next six months. Well, if you're going to invest for the next six months and you bought options on the mutual fund, or you bought the actual mutual fund, the best you're going to get is short-term capital gain. So if the thing moves in your favor, yes, you'll end up with gain, but it's all gonna be taxed at short-term gain. And if you're holding it for six months, um, it might go over year end, but you're really not talking about a lot of time differential on when you're recognizing the gain, but recognizing it all at short-term as opposed to recognizing it at 60% long-term or 40% and 40% short-term is a big difference. Um, so remember, um, 
when 60, we have 60% at a 20% tax rate, at 20% equals 12%. And we've got 40% at let me fix the five. Be confusing if you're taking screenshots. At 20% equals 12%, 40% at 37% equals 14.8%. And so you might hear people say that the tax rate on 1256 contracts. is 26.8%. You know, that's right and it's wrong. Um, when you combine it and you do the math, if you had $100,000 of gains on a 1256 contract, yes, you would pay $26,800 in tax. But when you're doing your tax planning, that's not how it really works. How it really works is that 40% of your gains are just go in as long-term gains and 60% of your gains go into short-term gains and then you can do your tax planning based on that. So if you could generate short-term losses, they would go against just the short-term gain portion of your 1256 contract gains. So don't think of it as a 26.8% tax rate. Um, it's a dangerous way to think about these things. Think about them just as creating 60% long-term gains, 40% short-term gains. So that gets us to why is it 60-40 to begin with? Why is it mark to market? It was mark to market to stop the abuse. 60-40 was then a compromise. First, you, you all of a sudden, you're making all the Chicago people pay taxes, then they never pay taxes before. You were going to turn all of their gains into short-term gains, um, be equitable, make it 60-40. And so they came up with the 60-40. Um, and then when they added options on non-equities, that, that's where things really got confusing um, because now we have all these different ways to make the same investment being given very, very different tax treatment. The other thing that becomes confusing um, because of the way they define um, non-equity options um, is you buy an option, buy an option on GLD. Right? And so you can Google GLD you could, if you have a trading account type of GLD. And what GLD is, is it trades on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and it's an entity that owns gold. And obviously if you, well, before I say obviously, when you look at the um, legal makeup of GLD, GLD is a grantor trust for tax purposes. And if it's a grantor trust, it's not a corporation. Which means this is a options on GLD. Are 1256 contracts. Because GLD is a grantor trust, GLD um, is not considered as an entity for tax purposes. Anyone who buys GLD um, is deemed to own so owner of GLD is deemed to own the gold that GLD owns. Which means if you have gains on the sale of GLD, it's treated as a gain from the sale of gold. 
right? If it's short term, it's taxed at 37%. And if it's long term, the tax rate on gold, because it's a collectible, is 28%. So no matter how long you hold GLD, if you have a gain on GLD, it's going to be taxed at a higher rate um, than the effective rate on holding um, an option on GLD. And then finally, the last thing that's confusing, just in general, with respect to buying ETFs now, when you buy an ETF, and an ETF is an exchange traded fund. So these are things that trade on the stock exchange, they trade on a daily basis, um, except you have to see what are they legally? Or what are they for tax purposes? And I'm drawing a distinction because some of these things might be a trust for legal purposes and for tax purposes, they've elected to be a corporation. But what are they for tax purposes? If they're a corporation, then any options are 1234 options. If they're a partnership or a trust, they're 1256 options. And when you go in and you make the trade, you have no idea at the time you're making the trade, unless you've researched it, what these things are for tax purposes, because they're just gonna have a name and the name could be anything. Um, very rarely do they have the name corporation in it. Um, so you really have to check and see what is what are these things treated for tax purposes to understand how the options on these things are treated. All right, so so far we've talked about futures contracts and non-equity options. And then the third um, 1256 contract that I want you to be responsible for in this class are foreign currency options. A foreign currency contract, I'm sorry. So a foreign currency contract is a futures contract. Um, a forward contract. Or a listed option. On a foreign currency. And remember when I say foreign currency, everything were US dollar centric, right? When I listed all the 1256 contracts on currencies, I didn't list the US dollar. We don't trade contracts on the US dollar in the US. All right, so in India, you would be trading contracts on the US dollar. Those aren't 1256 contracts because you're not trading them on a US exchange. But futures contracts, forward contracts, or a listed option on a foreign currency, a 1256 contracts. There's another code section, and we're not gonna cover it in this class, but you should get familiar with it if you're gonna do work in foreign currencies, um, is section 988. And obviously you're gonna be doing work in foreign currencies. If you're doing US taxpayers who are doing business in India, um, the, the rupee is going to be a foreign currency. And so you're gonna to have to know section 988. Um, the way, the, so the interreaction between 1256 and 988 is all of these, all of these contracts are mark to market. under 1256. And then the, the fault is that futures are 6040. But forwards and options, 
are ordinary. under 988. And then to make things more complicated, you can elect to switch the treatment. All right, like I said, I'm not gonna go deep into 988, but just know that foreign currency contracts are governed under 1256, they're governed under 988, um, and those two rules are going to um, inter have to interact with each other. The default for futures contracts on, on foreign currencies is that they get 1256 contracts. However, the vast, vast majority of transactions in foreign currencies are in the interbank market. They're done with forward contracts. And while those forward contracts come under the definition of a 1256 contract, they also come under the definition of 988, and 988 will tell you that 988 triumphs over 1256 unless you make an election to, that you want to treat them under 1256. How, so as to character, so the forward contracts are going to get ordinary treatment under 988. They're going to be marked to market under 1256. Um, so forward, so foreign currencies have their own complexities. All right, so hopefully you followed all of this. Um, and so now what I wanna do is continue on with the rules of 1256. So the first, so let's just recap. When we now go, so now we have a 1256 contract. We know that at year end, recognize all gains and losses. Um, treat everything sixty percent long term and forty percent short term. And in subsequent year, adjust gain or loss to reflect the mark to market. Right. And I'll go through an example. So let's just go through an example right now. Um, I enter into enter a contract to buy 100 ounces of gold. Um, in for March 2022. At thirteen hundred and fifty dollars an ounce. Okay. Now December of twenty twenty one, um, the March gold. Is that $1,380 an ounce. So at year end, I have a gain of $30 an ounce. And again, it's $30 an ounce, it's 100 ounces. So I have $3,000 of taxable gain. $1,800 is long-term and 
the short term. And then in March, gold goes back down to $1,350 an ounce. And I actually buy the gold, I actually take delivery. Now, when we took delivery under an options contract, it was treated as a non-taxable event, right? It was treated as a purchase of the gold, purchase of the underlying commodity. We don't do that with 1256 contracts. When we take delivery, that's treated as though we sold the futures contract. Because remember, the price movement when we held the futures contract should be given 60-40 treatment. If we don't recognize that and somehow put it into the basis of the gold, we're gonna transform that gain or loss into an asset that, that's 100% long-term or 100% short-term. So when I take delivery, I treat the futures contract as closed. And I recognize gain or loss. Well, when you look at it, you say, gee, when I entered into this transaction, it was 1350. When I get out, it's 1350. I have no gain or loss, except that I have to adjust for last year's mark to market. And last year I had a recognized gain of $30. So now I have to recognize a loss. of $30 per ounce. And that's 3,000 overall, $3,000 loss. And economically I broke even. And for tax purposes, I broke an even. I have a $3,000 gain in year one and a $3,000 loss in year two. And we're gonna come up to, that, that creates a tax problem. And we'll come up with how Congress solved that problem in a, while, in a couple of minutes. Um, and now the question is, what's my basis in the gold? And so your basis in the gold equals its fair market value on date of, del on date of delivery um, or receipt in this case. And that makes sense because I've recognized all the gain and loss between what I started with and where it's ending up now. Now, in my case, I had it so that it ended up the same. But if I had started with a $1,360 um, purchase price, I would have a $10 loss when everything's all said and done because I was, I'm forced to buy a $1,360. It's only worth $1,350. Um, I don't look at how much I'm paying for it because that $10 loss is going to be recognized through my futures contract. And so I always take on the fair market value on date of delivery. So my basis in the gold is $1,350 per ounce. So now we've dealt with terminations. We treat a termination as though we've um, terminated our interest in the futures contract. We recognize the inherent gain or loss in the futures contract. If we recognize the gain or loss in the prior year, we adjust the final gain or loss to reflect um, what was done in the prior year. And remember, the way to prove that yourself that this is right is economically what happened? Economically, we broke even. We started with a contract um, to buy gold at 1350. Gold was worth 1350 in March. In 2021, we had $3,000 of taxable gain. Well, if we're going to break even, and in 2022, we have a $3,000 taxable loss. And remember, this $3,000 is always 60-40. And then our basis in gold is its fair market value, and the fair market value is $13.50 an ounce. All right, so that's what happens on termination. 
Um, so I'm going to give, I'm also going to give an example of what happens if you were the seller of gold under a contract, but I'm not going to go over year end because I don't want to make it too complicated. So I own gold. I own 100 ounces of gold and it's got a basis of 1,200 an ounce. And I enter into a forward contract or into a futures contract, sorry, futures contract. to sell the gold at 1350 an ounce. And gold is at Time of delivery. So, so what I have in total, so in total, I have $180 per ounce of profit. But now I end up with a strange result. So the result is when I make the delivery, um, I'm delivering it under the futures contract. I'm going to receive 1,350 um, an ounce in gold. But because I entered into a futures contract to sell, that means I have a $30 loss on the futures contract. And what I do is I say, well, how much is the gold really worth on the day that I make delivery? And that's the amount I'm deemed to have sold it for. And so gold is trading at 1380. My basis in the gold is 1200. I have $180 gain on the underlying gold. And that's the way I would treat the transaction. Now, when we get into the straddle rules next week, we'll see what happens with the nature of the gain and the loss on this transaction. But remember that you're gonna end up with a $30 loss on the futures contract because you entered into a futures contract to sell at 1350, it went up to 1380, you lost $30 on the futures contract but now you're selling the gold for its then fair market value, which is $180 gain on the underlying gold. So just remember whether you're taking delivery, when you're taking delivery, your basis is the fair market value of the gold. When you're making delivery, your sales price is also the fair market value of the gold at the time you make or take delivery. Okay, so we've dealt with year end mark to markets. We then talk about the subsequent years gain or loss and how that then gets we take into account the prior year as mark to market. Um, and by the way, I have homework for you on this so you can practice. Um, and I will get back to you on the homework and make sure that everything is clear. And if it's not, always email me. Um, or if you want, we could Zoom and we could talk about this if this gets really confusing. So now, um, let me get rid of all this. And there's one major problem that I've gone over really quickly. So in year one, we had a $3,000 gain. But when you see 3,000, no one gets excited about 3,000. So let's make it 3 million. We have a $3 million gain. And then in year two, it reverses. It goes right back to where we started from. 
And so in year two, we have a $3,000 loss. Well, they're both treated as 60% long-term, 40% short-term, but what's the rule for individuals? Can individuals carry back losses? And the answer is no. Individuals can only carry forward capital losses. So you look at this and you go, oh my God, um, we have $3 million of gain. Again, let's call it that effective 28% tax rate. Um, they're gonna have to pay $840,000 in taxes. You know, approximately $840,000 um, for year one. And in year two, they get no tax benefit. Because if you have losses, you can't deduct them. Let's forget about the $3,000. So there's no tax benefit in year two. So you look at this transaction economically, we broke even, but taxes were out. $840,000 and taxpayers said, this just isn't fair. And Congress said, you're right, this isn't fair. Now Congress could have said, to the extent you had gained from a commodities transaction in a prior year and you have a loss in the current year, you can carry back the loss to, to offset that gain as long as it relates to the same futures contract. But they didn't do that. They really were much nicer. And so this is the rule that Congress came up with. So first, carry back 1256 losses for three years. But in determining, to determine current year's loss, 1256 loss, first offset against this year's regular capital gains. And again, I'm gonna go through an example. So don't get excited. Um, we're gonna first offset against this year's regular capital gains. And that, that will tell us how much we can, so, after step two, there is a loss. That is the amount to carry back. Now, when you carry back, you only carry back to years that have a net section 1256 gain. And what does that mean a net section 1256 gain? If in the prior year um, you had a million dollars of 1256 gains, and um, 300,000 of other capital losses. When you did that to your tax returns, they netted. So for that year, for these purposes, you don't have a million of 1256 gains, you have 700,000 of 1256 gains. And by the way, if those $300,000 of other capital losses were all short term, that means even though we split it 60, 40, 600,000 was taxed at long-term rates, only 100,000 were taxed at short-term rates, it's still 700,000 of 1256 gains. And when we go back, we're gonna just wipe out the entire 700,000 if we have 700,000. Um, and then five, 
after applying the losses, anything left over goes on as a reg regular capital loss carry forward. And the carry forward is broken out sixty forty. So when everything is all said and done, um, there's a hundred thousand dollars remaining. We don't care what kind of gain or loss it actually wiped out when you took it back. Whatever is remaining then goes forward to 6040. So it'd be 60,000 long term, 40,000 short term, and it's just a regular capital loss carry forward. You can have any type of gains you want in future years to use it against. So it's just a regular capital loss, All right? So we've gone through a lot of rules. And like I said, we have to do an example. Because if we don't do an example, this becomes impossible to follow. So let me stop sharing for a second. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. And let's just go through the PowerPoints and make sure. So foreign currency contracts are Section 1256 contracts. And then the one that creates all these problems and all the confusion are these non-equity options. I left out the next two. You're not responsible for them. So you're not responsible for a dealer equity option. You're not responsible for a dealer security futures contract. Just know they exist. So if they come up in real life, you'll know these are 1256 contracts, but they're very rare. We talked about terminations of contracts. They're treated as um, taxable events. So whatever relates to the 1256 contract is 1256. And then if you're receiving the um, asset because you were buying the asset, your basis becomes the fair market value. If you're selling the asset, you're selling it at its fair market value. Um, let's just skip straddles. We're gonna talk about straddles next week. And mixed straddles, we're not even gonna talk about. Um, they're too complex, We're really beyond the scope of this course. Um, and again, if any of you have clients that have mixed straddles and you want to talk to me about mixed straddles, I'm happy to talk to you about it. But I think to try to go through it in this course would be a major mistake. Um, hedging transactions, when you use 1256 contracts to hedge in your ordinary course of business, they're given ordinary treatment. So that's what we talked about in the first, the second day of class that hedgers get ordinary treatment on their um, use of financial instruments if it's used in their ordinary course of business. Now, what's nice is with 1256 contracts is the mark-to-market rules don't apply to hedging transactions. Um, so you don't get any mismatches of income in your regular course of business. Um, forget about syndicates. Um, just know once a contract is identified as a hedging transaction, that's it. It's a hedging transaction for tax purposes. Any gain or loss is going to be ordinary. You can't treat it as capital once you identify it as a hedge. Um, if a section 1256 contract can be treated as ordinary income property under any other code section, the other code section prevails. So that's why when we have this conflict between 988 and 1256, 988 prevails except 988 tells us that futures contracts are treated under 1256 as capital. And as I said, you can make all these elections to either get out of 1256 or get out of 988 when you're dealing with foreign currencies. And traders in section 1256 contracts, they all get capital gain treatment, which is what they want, because hopefully they're making money if they're trading in these things. Um, forget about the limited partners of dealer equity options. By the way, if I have a loss um, because of a mark to market at the end of the year, and then I close the transaction, um, so I have a loss, then I close the transaction, then I buy another 
1256 contract in the same commodity, um, the wash sale rules don't apply to that loss. If I'm recognizing something under the year end mark to market rules, I don't got to start worrying about 30 days before, or after, or any of that nonsense. The wash sale rules will not apply to any losses taken into account because of a year end mark to market. And now we come to the carry back. And let's, um, so let's go through the example. Um, and by the way, I skipped the slide, um, special situations. When someone dies with a futures contract, it doesn't matter if they're long or they're short, it's treated as an asset to get a step up in basis. But now let's go through um, the carry back rules. Um, so T has net section 1256 losses of 500,000 in 2020. T also has $100,000 of other short-term capital gains in 2020. How much can T carry back? So we say, oh, they've got 1256 losses of 500,000. But the first thing we do is say, do you have any other short-term gain, any other capital gains in 2020? In this case, the answer is yes. And we net them then. And so now we have $400,000 of 1256 gains. And again, we don't care that it's all going against short-term gains. I'm sorry, we have 400,000 of net 1256 losses. So we go back and we say, oh, in 2016, we have 400,000 of 1256 gains. We could just carry 400,000 back against 400,000 and we're done. The problem is that's 2016. You can't go back four years. You can only go back three years. So whatever happened in 2016 is irrelevant. Now we go to 2017. In 2017, T had 250,000 of capital gains, but none from 1256 contracts. How much of the loss may be carried back to 2017? And the answer is zero. We can't just go back against regular capital gains. We can only go back against 1256 gains. So, so far, um, T looks like they're out of luck. Now we go to 2018 and T had no capital gains from any source. Well, if you have no capital gains from any source, you certainly can't carry back to 2018. So T still has $400,000 of losses available to carry back. And they've got one more year to look at. And now we go to 2019 and luckily they have 1256 gains of 200,000 and other capital losses of 50,000. Well, you net them. So T in um, 2019 only had to pay tax on $150,000 of capital gains from their 1256 transactions. So we can carry back $150,000. So when everything's all said and done, we've got 400,000, we can carry back 150,000. That's gonna leave us with 250,000 going forward. And that's gonna be treated as 60, 40. So it'll be 150 long-term, 100 short-term. And if you want, let's go back to the whiteboard and now let's actually do it on the whiteboard so you can see it. And then you'll have a chance to write these things down as I'm writing them down. And I think that's easier for you. So again, in 2020, we have 500,000 of 1256 losses. We have 100,000 of short-term gains from other property. We net them. And so after we net them, we now have 400,000 of 1256 losses available. 2016 is irrelevant. I don't care what we had in 2016, it doesn't matter. It's four years ago. 2017, um, I don't remember the number, but we had gains. I think we had 250,000 of gains. but not 1256. Can't carry back. 
2018, no gains or losses. Nothing to carry back. Two thousand nineteen, we have two hundred thousand twelve fifty six gains. We have fifty thousand uh, short term losses. Right, I'm not sure if I'm remembering the numbers correctly. So if it was 250 and 100, it's the same concept. We net these. And what do we end up after we net these? We end up with 150,000, 1256 gains. All right, you know, very quickly, so I don't want to confuse everybody. Let me go back to um, the PowerPoint because I'm forgetting what really happened in that year. That was 250, I actually remembered it correctly. That's a shock. Okay, so we've got 150,000 of 1256 gains. Um, we carry back. One hundred and fifty thousand. That leaves us two hundred and fifty thousand carry forward. When we carry them forward, it's one hundred and fifty thousand long term, long term loss, and it's a hundred thousand. Short term loss. And when they go forward, they're just regular losses. They're no longer 1256. So the carry forward loses the 1256 tank. Okay. Um, so this is how we deal with the carry back situation. This is how you would write out the answer and figure out the answer to the problem that was in the PowerPoint. There was one other problem in the PowerPoint that I skipped over. So let's go back to that. And that'll be the last thing that we do in this class um, for tonight anyway. So let's go back. Okay. Um, October of 2019, T purchases a March 2020 Gold Futures contract at 1320. On December 31st, the value of the contract was 1380. And in March, T takes delivery of the gold at a price of 1400. So what are the amounts of gain or loss T must recognize with respect to the futures contract? And what is T's basis in the gold? So we've already done this, but so let's just do this without going back to the whiteboard. Um, we entered into the contract when it was 1320. On December 31st, it's now 1380. That's a $60 gain. Um, we have one contract that's dealing with 100 ounces of gold, $60 a gain. There's a $6,000 gain in dollars. 60% of that is long-term, 40% of that is short-term. We then take delivery of the gold at a price of 1400. Well, that means we have another $20 gain with respect to the futures contract. Um, so when you look at it overall, it's an $80 gain on the overall contract, but we already recognized 60 in the prior year. Since we already recognized 60 in the prior year, we only have to recognize an additional 20 in 2020. That's an additional $2,000 a gain. Again, 1,200 long-term, 800 short-term. And then our basis in the gold is going to be $1,400 an ounce. All right, so I think that covers everything with section 1256 contracts. So like I said, they, um, have this crazy result. And when you look at them today, just looking at it, you know, where we stand today um, is hard to follow. 
But when you go back and look at the history and see how this whole thing developed and why this was put in the law in the first place, how we got this 60-40 treatment, then we added um, non-equity options, which I think creates a tremendous amount of confusion, but also creates a lot of planning opportunities. So when you have clients that are doing transactions um, and options, if they're doing transactions in the S&P 500, they're doing transactions um, in things that are traded on an exchange like gold or silver, SLV, um, or ETFs. If, if instead of buying the ETF, they wanted to buy options on the ETF, and come up with the same economics, they're gonna end up with very different tax consequences. Um, and most investors, not only most investors, most lawyers and accountants just don't know these rules. They're not familiar with this stuff. Um, and you can really add a lot of value for your clients. So again, um, there's going to be homework assigned with this um, as usual. Um, and if this starts getting confusing or really anything in the course gets confusing, always feel free to email me. Um, I'll obviously I'll respond to your email. And if you wanna talk face-to-face, -face, we can always set up Zoom meetings. All right, so next week we'll start with straddles. And, and by the way, so after straddles um, is going to be the midterm. And at the end of straddles, I'll talk about the midterm and what you should be doing to prepare for that. Okay, so we'll see you at straddles.